A very good morning to those of you who are joining us already. Thank you very much for being uh, not just on time, but early. I do appreciate it. Um, we are going to wait another minute or two before we start until 10 a.m. proper um, to make sure that everybody who wants to join us live today can do so. Um, so you can take a couple of minutes just to relax, get yourself a, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, glass of water, whatever you would like to make sure you're comfortable while we are um, chatting today. Um, please do feel free to use the chat function and speak to each other. Everybody involved today is going to be either a linguist, uh, a language teacher, a Chinese teacher specifically, or somebody who is interested in literature. Um, and so I think you'll find you all have a lot in common. So please do feel free to use Zoom's chat function to introduce yourself to, to me and to each other. Let us know who you are. Um, you don't have to. Please don't feel obliged to, to participate at all. You are welcome to just sit back and watch us today. Um, do be aware if you do use the chat function, this seminar is being recorded. Um, it will be made available through um, the Language Shows cloud, and then eventually it will go onto the Language Shows YouTube channel. Um, so do just keep that in mind if you are choosing to participate today. We think we've got um, 20, 25 people signed up for the live session today, which is quite nice. We're about the same sizes as the classes that I usually teach, which is lovely. I, as we go through, will have the participants list open so that I can see you. I also plan on having the chat open. There we go. So if you do have any questions that you would like to ask, anything that you would like to add, kind of in addition to what I'm saying, then again, please do pop it into the chat. I will endeavor to um, answer as many questions as I can as we go through today. I will try my very best to take any comments that you have and, and pop those into the, the live seminar. If Due to time constraints, I don't have time to answer your question or to address your comment. I'm going to apologize for that in advance. What I will do is make sure that I am available over on Twitter um, throughout the whole of the weekend. I will give you my Twitter handle in just a minute. Um, and any questions that I get in the chat, any comments that I got, get in the chat um, for this will be addressed there. I hope that made sense. Um, oh, good morning, Claire. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for kicking us off with your introduction. Um, it's always nice for me to meet other Chinese teachers. Um, at my school right now, I'm the only Chinese teacher. Um, and so it is quite nice to even to remember that other people teach Chinese um, other than me. I believe, yeah, we are just after 10 o'clock now. So I think we will start in earnest. Welcome. Uh, my name is Darren Lester. I am a secondary Chinese teacher. Um, at my school, just to give you some context, interestingly, we only offer Chinese at the moment to our native Chinese speakers. So I currently teach A-level um, as, my, as my curriculum topic. I have done that for the last four years since the exam changed. So for those of you who teach in the British context, you know that we underwent uh, an A-level reform a few years ago. Chinese was one of the final exams to be affected. And there was a, it was a huge change because we had the sudden addition of film and literature that the European languages, French, which I also teach, German, which I also teach, Spanish, had already had under the old specification, but that in Chinese, we didn't particularly need to have. <clears throat> so the literature and film aspect has become much, much more important. To kind of prepare for that, um, I read as much as I could about Lushan. Um, and so I kind of, I feel now that in all of the research that I've done, I'm at a place where I am comfortable kind of sharing what I've learned and, and the connections that I've made. Uh, the, the book that I teach clearly is Hometown by Lushan. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, the connections, but I am going to draw in some of his other works as well, particularly Diary of a Madman and um, The True Story of RQ. For clarity, I am not affiliated with any exam board. Um, I do not write exam papers. I do not mark exam papers. I'm just a teacher. Um, so in terms of how um, 
relevant links between the life of the author and the essay questions are going to be. I have no more information on that than you do, but as we will discuss in a couple of minutes, I do think that's very, very important. I do think that's very interesting. Good morning, Valentina. It's really nice to have you here. Um, I'm really impressed with your credentials there. Lived in China for 13 years with your master's degree in teaching Chinese. Um, please do feel free if you want to um, add anything to anything that I say, please do um, join in the chat. I'm very happy for us to learn from each other's wisdom and experiences. Oh, no, that didn't work like it was supposed to. I apologize. Hopefully, if somebody in the chat could let me know, you should have seen a slide change now and have my Twitter handle there. Somebody could just let me know whether that slide did change. Um, because the way that I thought, perfect, thank you, Claire. The way that I thought my slide was going to change didn't work, um, but that's okay. So, as I've said, there will be a link to this PowerPoint tweeted out after this talk. So, if you want to use just the PowerPoint in your own lessons, please do. I'm not precious about that at all. Um, everything that I have here is um, all of the photos and stuff are um, either copyright free or wiki commons so that's all fine please do take it adjust it take slides out do whatever you need to do with it i will tweet that link through my twitter handle which is at mr underscore d underscore lester that will also be where i tweet out any extra information uh, or answer any questions that come up over the course of the weekend or alternatively please just join in with conversation. Like I said, it's really nice to meet other Chinese teachers today and other people who are interested in world literatures. So the first thing that I want to talk about, um, ironically, given the fact that we're focusing on the life of our author, is this concept of la mort de l'auteur, the death of the author. I couldn't find a nice Chinese translation for this, which actually brings us immediately into an interesting concept, which is taking Western literary values, Western literary ideas, and applying them to an Asian context. I've just finished teaching my film. I teach Beijing Bicycle as my film. Um, and we examined the concept of male gaze in the film, because in that film, um, the, the women are treated as objects to be desired and owned by the men. And so we looked at this concept of male gaze and it took me and some contacts that I have at, at universities who teach Chinese film quite a long time to come up with a nice Chinese phrase, a nice Chinese term for male gaze, because it's not something that has um, entered Chinese uh, literary and cinematic analysis yet. And it's the same for death of the author. This isn't something that is very widely discussed by Chinese literary critics. However, we as teachers, I as a teacher in England, teaching an English style exam, albeit to native speaking students, do have to take lots of these uh, Western values, Western um, concepts into account when I'm teaching. So I do just want to talk very quickly about the extent to which the life of Lucian might be relevant or should be taken into account when we are analysing um, a text. So in, uh, in 1967, this concept of death of the author was, um, was coined. And essentially what it boils down to is this idea that once an author has written a work, that's it they then have to be removed from it. So no more of their own history, no more of their own ideals, no more of their own values should be considered when analyzing the work. There is an extent to which I think that's a good thing. Um, I think particularly um, in times now where we have more access to writers, particularly contemporary writers, death of the author can be a very good way for you to continue enjoying a property, even if you realise that you are fundamentally against the values or the, uh, the morals of the person who writes them. Because sometimes it's very easy to say, oh, I've just learned this about this author, I've just learned that this author thinks this way that I disagree with, I can't like their works anymore and that's a shame. So death of the author where you go, okay, the person who wrote this was just a vehicle for this story to be told, therefore I can now ignore them and enjoy the story is a good way from an entertainment point of view just to keep enjoying it. In my opinion though, as somebody who has studied literature, um, I have a degree 
in English and classics and so that involved a lot of literary study um, and the classics section in particular involved looking not just at western classics the roman stuff but also at chinese classics the the four great novels um i think it's really important for us to keep the author's values the author's viewpoints the author's time current and in mind when we are analyzing their work and so that's kind of the point of my talk today. It's that I think that Lucian's life is very relevant to the things that we have to teach our students, to what we study. And for those of you who are not teachers, I hope that you will see his life is very relevant to stories that maybe I inspire you to go on and, and, and read later on. Um, and so I don't think that we can, we can pull them apart. Again, not being um, affiliated with the exam boards, teachers, I'm not saying that all of a sudden in your 350 hand cert that your students have to write, they've got to do these big paragraphs about Lucian's life. But if they can bring in some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, just some of the smaller points about how, um, about how his life has affected his work, uh, for me, that's good literary analysis. So we're going to start with his names. Lucian is a man who went by many, many names, which is very typical in both ancient and modern, though to a lesser extent in modern Chinese culture. <clears throat> As a writer, we would expect him to have many names. We would expect him to use pen names. I, as a writer, use pen names, um, mostly because there will be genre that you might want to write in, and you were gonna to want to keep all of those stories, all of those ideas together under the same name, but you then might write something completely different in a completely different genre. I don't necessarily need my academic work, which is published under Dara Lester, to be associated with my fiction because that's gonna be two completely different audiences. And so pen names, we, we kind of take for granted for writers. The pen name that we use is Lu Shun. That's his most famous pen name, particularly outside of China. But he did write all sorts of essays, particularly towards the end of his life, under a, a slew of different pen names. His birth name was George Ang Shou. He then took a courtesy name. Now, for those of you who are less familiar with Chinese culture, um, a courtesy name was a name taken by educated males because in the, the Book of Rights, which essentially is a book which outlines uh, the social mores of Chinese culture, it says, and I've got my quote here to make sure that I get it right, um, it's wrong for people of the same generation to use your birth name. That's a privilege for people who are older than you. So we are looking at the Chinese idea here of, of rank, of age, of seniority. So you take a courtesy name, which um, is then used by your peers. It's not quite the same as a nickname, but it is a name that your peers are going to use, that your peers are going to, to go by. He then took a pre-naval given name. So he took a different name just before he went into his schooling. Um, and he took the name Shurem, which if you look at it metaphorically, because Chinese names all have a variety of meanings depending on how we're choosing to read the characters, how we're choosing to read the Hansa. Um, it can be read as an educated person. That was a name that he chose himself. It was a name that he gave to himself. So from that, we can learn that Lucian himself either considered himself to be or aspired to be an educated person. Naming conventions, for those of you who are not familiar with Chinese culture and language, um, Chinese naming conventions are very, very important. It's very important generally for Chinese parents to pick exactly the right name for their, for their children. Um, when I study youth culture with my, my year 12, my 17 year old native speakers, I quite often say to them, when you have children, will you still go and consult a fortune teller about their name? you know, like maybe your parents did, like your grandparents did. And I would say 80, 90% of them say yes. They will go and consult somebody to figure out the best combination of characters to give as a name for their child. Very different um, to how Western baby names are, are often picked. And so naming is very, very important. 
But if we look at um, the three big works of Lu Sheng, his characters don't have names. So in Diary of, Diary of a Madman, we are told right in the introduction by the, the narrator, um, two brothers whose names I don't need to mention here. In RQ, we're told, I don't really know what RQ's surname was. Then in Hometown, there is no reference to a name at all. He's just referred to as what, as I, throughout the whole thing, because it's told in the first person. Uh, this is where I will make an exam point. We learned in the very first examiner feedback after the first set of exams that when students refer to I in essays about hometown, they should write what, they should never say that it's Lu Shun. So while we are making these connections today, it is wrong for us to say that the first person narrator of hometown is Lu Shun, because it's not, it's a fictitious person, it's a fictitious narrator. Um, but it's interesting to me that this man who has five names that we're looking at here, including two courtesy names, two names that he wanted his peers to use, would then go on to not use names for so many of his well-known main characters. I have a theory as to why, which we'll come to a little bit later, because it links to something that happens in his early life. Um, and again, if as we go through you have any, any insights or any ideas, or you just want to tell me that you think my theory is wrong, that's absolutely okay. Um, like I said, I do have the chat open to let you, uh, so that you can do that, so that we can communicate. So Lucian himself came from a very wealthy family. They had been a very wealthy family for centuries before Lucian was born. They were a member of the gentrified land-owning classes. They had been pawnbrokers. He had had family members in multiple government positions. They were very well respected. They were very wealthy. And they had been pretty much for as long as the family had been around. That's very important to us when we are studying hometown because we know that I's family had been very wealthy. Something happened for them to lose all of that money, but they had in the past been a generational wealth family. So straight away, even looking at Lucian's life from before he was born, we can make that link. We can say that he's drawing on his own experiences here. His paternal grandfather, that is his dad's dad, and that's quite important because in Chinese we do make the distinction between where grandparents come um, on different sides of the family. Um, he was a member of the Hanlin, uh, the Hanlin Academy, which was the highest rank that you could achieve at that time. He was as successful a person as you could be at that time. That then puts a lot of pressure on the family as we go down the line. That puts a lot of pressure on his son, so Lucian's father, and then Lucian himself. And we kind of see that pressure playing out at different points in Lucian's life. But we've got a very successful family, a very high ranking family that he comes from. But by the time Lucian came along, his family's wealth and their importance were declining. Um, quite why that is, is not clear. Although, there is the, um, the possibility, I suppose, of pinning a lot of this on Lucian's father. Lucian's dad had gone from school to take civil service exams, just like his father had, just like Lucian and his brothers were um, expected to do, as, as was quite normal in China at this point in time. We're looking at the late 1800s, the early 1900s right now, just for some time scale for those of you who are not sure. Um, so he took the lowest level of exams. He was able to get himself an entry level job, but he couldn't progress any further. Of course, if you've then got your own father, who is the highest possible rank that you can be, that's going to be quite stressful on you. That's going to be quite shaming, perhaps, on you. That's going to be really hard, I think. Just, you know, we don't know this. We to my knowledge, we have no writings from Lucian's dad about any of his feelings about this, but from my point of view, that would be really stressful. And, and 
frustrating, I would imagine, to want to climb the ladder, to have wanted to climb the ladder enough to take those extra exams, but not to be able to progress. Now, in 1893, we have this point where Lucian's father tried to bribe a government official. Um, bribery was illegal at this time, and it um, was punished with the death penalty. Capital punishment was the punishment for bribery at this point in time. In spite of it being Lucian's father who had attempted to bribe the official, it was his grandfather who was arrested, tried and sentenced. He was in fact sentenced to beheading. Again, just thinking about this as a person, that's gonna have a massive emotional impact on you for you to have done something wrong, for your father not just to take the blame for that, but to potentially be executed as the punishment. And then when you've got yourself or when you are in this high ranking family, you've got all these people around you watching you because you're a high ranking family and they see that you've messed up and you've then cost this high ranking official his life, that's gonna put more pressure onto you. This, I, I imagine this would have been a very, very stressful time for him. It is believed, although we have no real evidence for this, that um, the family then bribed yet more officials in order to try and stop the beheading. Um, if that happened, it worked because uh, Lucian's grandfather ultimately was not beheaded. The sentence was commuted to imprisonment. So we've got quite a lot of um, family drama happening when Lucian was only very, very young. And all of this feeds into his work. Those of you who are familiar with his work, but maybe not so familiar with his life, might already be making the connections with the things that you've read. So Lucian himself was born on the 25th of September, 1891. And for those of you who are not familiar with Chinese, it might be interesting for you to note that in Chinese, we work the other way. We go year to month to day. And that's very common across Asian cultures where you work from a biggest to smallest idea. So even when we write our addresses, the first line of your address is going to be Asia because we work continent biggest down to house apartment number, which is smallest. His father ultimately died when he was five years old. Um, as I've just said, the, it's believed, it's likely that his own father's trial had a very heavy emotional impact on him. And he took to heavy opium and alcohol use, which caused his health to decline very, very quickly. Um, rather than going to a traditional herbalist doctor or to a Western style doctor, he paid for um, quick medicine such as, and I quite like this, sugar cane, which has thrice survived frost. That didn't work. And his father died of an asthma attack when he was just 35. So even younger than me, um, which I always find quite, um, quite shocking. Um, his mother was also from the wealthy landed gentry classes. Like most women of her time, she hadn't gone to school. It was considered improper for women to go to school to be educated. But she had taught herself to read and write. She was an intelligent woman. Um, and she was as invested in her family's success as her husband had been. Again, if you think about the um, characterization we have of, of I's mother in hometown, we can see that same thing. We see that she comes from money. We see that she is used to the finer things in life. We see that the loss of the money has impacted on her. She's become withdrawn. She's become lonely. There is no father mentioned. There's no husband mentioned in hometown. War at no point mentions his dad. We don't know what happens to him at all. It's not a stretch, in my opinion, to assume that this is autobiographical, that Lucian was taking all of these things from his own life and applying them to the character of war as he was writing. Again, there's no real evidence for that. This is just what we do as, as literary analysts, looking at things and trying to make connections. Lucian hated going to school, um, which 
I think I want to say is ironic, given that he later became a teacher. But actually, to be fair, I have met lots of teachers who have said, oh, yeah, I became a teacher because I didn't like my own education. So, you know, maybe that's a, that's quite a normal, a normal path. His early education was very traditional and it was based around the Confucian classics, the Confucian ideals. So he studied poetry, philosophy and history. His preference uh, was like mine, quite honestly, he liked folk stories. Um, I, I, I tell my my year 12 is my natives my favorite book ever is in fact journey to the west because i think that's brilliant they all laugh at me um but but for me that's a fantastic book because of the stories because of the monsters it, it kind of captures my interest so i'm in agreement with lucian that that folk stories folk traditions are are, are much more interesting um but of course that wasn't covered in his learning and so he liked to spend his free time going to the local opera to see those stories performed, listening to these monster stories and to ghost stories told to him by um, his servant, Ah Chang, who raised him, essentially. You know, she was the servant in his house, but she did all of the, the, the mothering without wishing to do Lucian's mother a disservice. She did all of the mothering. Um, he called her Chang Mama, which shows his um love his affection for her mother chang again for those of you who who don't know chinese um but she was a very superstitious woman which perhaps fostered his love for these stories um there's a very well-known story that at one point she trod on his pet mouse and killed it and that's kind of where the story ends it's this little factoid that crops up in all of these biographies um about lucian and it's interesting to me because clearly that had enough of a psychological impact on him that the woman he saw as a, a mother figure killed the mouse that he loved by accident, that it keeps cropping up um, in all of these little vignettes about his life. We see his interest in old religion and his, his mocking of Confucianism and of what we might consider to be organized religion in hometown through the character of Run Tu. Now, Run Tu is a very important character. He is, in my opinion, in fact, the main character of hometown, despite not being our focalizing character, because the story is about him and how his progress, his growth mirrored um, eyes growth, but on opposite ends of the spectrum. And Runtu is a very religious person, as we would imagine um, the farming communities in rural 1920s China to have been. Um, Runtu is a, a personification of the Confucian concept of Run. Run is, unfortunately for me, the most difficult Confucian concept to try and explain in English. Um, but I, I think it essentially boils down to um, the positive qualities of virtuous people, good people, who attempt to live a life of altruism. So it goes just beyond being a good person, and it goes to being a good person who will do things for others at the detriment of themselves because they are good people. That's kind of how I've, I've narrowed it down. And, and we see that altruism from Run to right at the end of the, of the story. Um, Wall's mother is giving away all of their possessions in this story. The, the family has essentially gone bankrupt and they're having to sell off their house. They're having to sell off their possessions. And so the narrator of the story, I, goes back to his hometown, back to his house to help his mother pack it up and to get rid of all of their stuff. She tells them, uh, the mother tells Run too that he can take anything he wants from the house. And he chooses to take some incense burners. We know from a bit earlier on that he's got lots of children. He's got quite a miserable home life because he works all day to feed, um, to feed all of these kids and, and he relies on the harvest. And we have long descriptive um, sections in the story about how difficult life for the peasant classes in China was at this time. And instead of taking any of the food, 
we know that there is food because in fact um i's mother fixes them both a, a meal in a, in a good mothering way um towards the beginning of the story he doesn't take any food to help to feed his his family he doesn't take any of the expensive ornaments any of the jewelry that he might be able to sell he takes these um incense burners religious items He's leaving behind all of the expensive stuff and all of the food for other people to use, other people to take and sell, for Wolves' mother to be able to sell and have that money. And he just takes a small religious trinket. The narrator, I, actually makes fun of this. Um, he points out that he could have taken anything he wanted and he opts for the religious thing. But then at the end, at the very end, of the story, we get I reflecting on that. And, and he actually has this moment of self-awareness where he says, I made fun of Runtu because he was following the Confucian ideas. He was worshiping the old gods. But in fact, what I was doing was worshiping hope. I was worshiping nostalgia. I was worshiping the idea that my hometown should be this place for me to run to. And, and I has this, this moment of clarity that I like to think was uh, a moment of clarity for Lu Shun as well, where he kind of went, people can worship anything. People can turn anything into a religion, be that actual religion, be that the stories that I, that, that Lu Shun liked as, as kids. Um, and, and of course the, the, the outcome of that is that it doesn't fit with where China is going. It doesn't fit with this modernization that we want to happen. Um, ultimately, Lu Xun took just one civil service exam like his father did, uh, but he dropped out of traditional Chinese education. He had intended to go to a very expensive private school, um, but by this point, just like in hometown, the family was losing money. They couldn't afford to send him. So he went to a naval academy that specialized in Western education. His mother was so upset that he was trying to pursue a Western education instead of a traditional Chinese education that she told him to change his name. Because she said, if you keep your name and you go on and pursue this Western style education, you will bring shame on our family. Is this perhaps why we never learn the narrator's name in hometown? Is this why we never learn um, RQ's actual name. Is this why in uh, Diary of a Madman, the names of the brothers are not important? In universe, is it because there's this concept of shame and of people knowing your name, of having your name attached to something that is so important, so ingrained, that we're just not going to mention the names at all? And I think about this a lot when I publish or when I do these talks and things that have got my actual name on them. There is for me an extra pressure to make them good because they are attached to me, they're attached to my name, they're attached to my family name. So it does reflect on my family. And, you know, I don't have any familial pressure. Um, my parents are just happy that I'm doing stuff like this that I really enjoy. So to then come from a, a formerly, formerly rich family um, where the name means something, I think that's got to be a connection. I really do believe that must be connected. Of course, we also have to acknowledge death of the author reason that when you're talking in first person, when you're using a first person narrator, it's very hard to introduce their name without doing a very cheesy, oh, hello, my name is, or by trying to um, shoehorn in another character calling them by their name. So, you know, for hometown specifically, we just have that issue. Um, but I do think there is this connection between his mum saying, no, you can't study a Western education, this stuff that you're interested in, and keep your family name. It shames us. Again, I think the psychological impact that, that must have had on him would have been massive. Ultimately, he left that school after just half a year. So he went through all of that, what we could call trauma, and it was probably for nothing, because he left. Um, he sat his civil service exam. He came 137th out of 500, a fine average, considering he later went on to teach 
and to be renowned as this very influential, very intellectual man, that is quite surprising. But that I think is the start of his uh, journey into literature. He had intended to sit higher exams. He knew that he was clever. Remember, he chose educated person as one of his names, but the death of one of his brothers upset that plan because he found himself now having to um, care for, begin to support his family. He finished his study at the School of Mines and Railway, which was a school, a local school to him that was set up uh, because they believed that the local mine was going to be a big success and was going to change the future of his town. It didn't. It actually went bust, but the school stayed open. So once again, we have this idea of the town not living up to its expectation. We have these grandiose ideas of the town council, to use a British analogy, saying, yes, we're opening this mine. It's going to bring in lots of jobs. It's going to make our town wealthy. We're going to be great. And then that doesn't pan out. And we see that in hometown through the nostalgia that War feels for his hometown. And then the disappointment when he gets there. And those points where he goes, no, 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 this isn't how I remember it. I'm in a bad mood, so I'm remembering wrong. He's not remembering wrong. He's just seeing it through rose-colored spectacles. Maybe he brought it into the propaganda that his town was giving him because he was a child. He didn't know any better. While undertaking his Western studies, he had studied Western lit, philosophy, history, and science. He was particularly interested in English and German, and we see a big interest in languages from him from this point on. He was one of us. Um, he began to read influential writers, such as British writer T.H. Huxley, and he began to experience racism at that school, which we think impacted on his sense of nationalism, his sense of what it meant to be Chinese, because he began to defend what it was to be Chinese. He began to feel that it was very important to be Chinese, but also to try and redefine what it meant to be Chinese. He ultimately wanted Chinese identity to be the best that it can be. When he was nominated for the Nobel Prize, which is a slide that I don't think we're going to get to because I only have five minutes left. I'm very, very sorry. Um, he said that he refused the nomination. Uh, he said he did not want to be nominated for the Nobel Prize because he thought he was a token nomination. He said to the, the nominating committee, if you're nominating me just because I'm Chinese, that's worthless. Nominate me because my works are worth nominating. I, as somebody who loves his works, does think that he should have had the Nobel Prize for Literature. I think he stood on his own two feet. But already, we are seeing at that point from him, this idea of, yes, I'm Chinese. Yes, I'm proud to be Chinese, but that has to mean something, not just this kind of oriental exoticism that we're seeing from the West at this point. This was in the 1940s, 1950s. He had planned to become a Western style doctor. He wanted to help people now. He wanted to go into the sciences, which ultimately was what he taught. He didn't teach literature for a very long time. When he became a teacher, he taught science. Um, in order to do that, and in order to kind of make sure he didn't shame his family anymore, he went to Japan. And he studied at the Korbun Institute, which was the language school for Chinese students in Japan. We know these days China and Japan um, have a slightly rocky relationship, but at this point in time, um, it was quite a strong relationship between the two countries and um, exchanges of students back and forth were very, very welcome. They were encouraged. At this point, he cut off his queue. Now, for those of you who are not sure, if you picture a traditional ancient Chinese style man, chances are what you are picturing is a man whose hair is kind of receded or bald at the front where it's been shaved off. That was depressingly easy to do. Okay, um, and then a ponytail, a braided ponytail at the back. That's the cue. That was a compulsory hairstyle for men in China at this point of, in time. And that's why it's kind of ingrained as a Westerner in our mentality as a picture of China, a picture of a Chinese person. He cut off his cue as a symbol of cutting off his association with old China. If he had done this in China, that would have been very controversial, possibly arrestable, depending on 
his relationship with local government. In Japan, it was seen still as an act of defiance, but the, the, the Chinese embassy kind of let it go. They said, well, you're in Japan now. It doesn't really matter. Um, you do you, essentially. However, when he went back to China, um, when his study abroad ended, um, he was mocked for having one. Um, he was so mocked that he actually bought a fake one, kind of like a toupee, but just a ponytail. But he never wore it because um, he was too embarrassed. He thought that it would look fake. Um, you know, I think lots of people can relate to that idea. Um, instead, he leaned into his westernization. He wore Western style clothes. He, I'm sorry if you can hear my cat crying right now. Um, he wore Western style clothes. He grew his hair in, in a Western style. He grew a mustache. Um, and he earned, he earned himself the nickname fake foreign devil because he just learned into the fact that I was gonna say that he wasn't Chinese, but that's not true. He leaned into the fact that perhaps he felt more Chinese than any of the others did. He just wanted what it meant to be Chinese to be different. If we look again at hometown, the only physical description we get of Ai is the fact that he has a beard. Very unusual for Chinese men to have a beard. It's not really made fun of, it's not mentioned, um, apart from by the prostitutes. The, the lady who owns the tofu um, shop. And she only mentions it because she's talking about, or she only draws attention to it because she's talking about how he's a man now. And the beard is how um, she knows that he's a man as opposed to a boy when he last saw her. And again, I can't help think that his own leanings into a, a more westernized appearance, his rejection of the cue of the traditional Chinese clothes influenced that, influenced that depiction, that idea, that concept. He began to study at the Sendai Medical um, Academy. I'm having to consult my notes now because I'm covering up my little, uh, my section of the PowerPoint. Um, but at this point in time, Japanese lecturers were showing Chinese students photos of what was happening in the war that was currently going on. So there was a war that was going on between Russia and China, and Japan was involved. Um, and lecturers began to show these, um, th these slides of, of pictures of what was happening. And the story goes that after one particular lecture, uh, Lu Xun saw a, a horrific one of a Chinese spy who was kneeling about to be beheaded. And at that point he realized, or at that point his, his perception changed and he thought, no, what my people need is not a physical doctor. What my people need is not somebody to cure their physical ailments, but a literary doctor. Somebody who can, cure, who can cure their spiritual problems. Somebody who can provoke change through writing. So he left his degree. He dropped out of school once again. He didn't tell anybody, but in 1906, he dropped out of university um, and he traveled to Tokyo. There he went to the Chinese embassy to make sure that his, um, his visa was still valid. They said that was fine. He enrolled in a German institute. He didn't need to take classes in the German institute, but he did begin to read German philosophy. And of course, this began to um, influence his socialist, his more communist, more Marxist ideas, those leanings. Um, about, I'm going to skip over this because it's a quote that you can come back and read, but this is what he had to say about seeing that slide um, and about the um, reasons that he left. So I apologize for not leaving that up for too long for you to look at, um, but like I said, do please download the PowerPoint so that you can get a little bit more information on that. In June 1906, um, a rumor reached his mother that he had married a Japanese girl. So she, the, her, his mother, feigned illness to bring him back from Japan to China. And she then forced an arranged marriage on him. 
his wife was called Juan, and he said, she was a present from my mother. All I can do is support her. Love is beyond my knowledge. And again, the last point that I want to make today, see, Lucian is such a complex character. Um, I should have known that we wouldn't get through his whole life in 45 minutes. Um, we see that in hometown with how he interacts with the female characters. The only female character that there is a potential love interest is with the prostitutes, where clearly there is no love. Um, we don't know that he uses her services, but that would be a financial transaction. Runtu's relationship with his wife is an unhappy one. Runtu is miserable because he's got all of his kids. He is sad, he is depressed. And so Lucian's work doesn't ever show love as being a positive thing. And because Lucian himself believed that that was something of which he was incapable. It is now quarter to 11 um, by my reckoning. And I've run out of time, I can't believe it. I am so sorry. I'm so grateful to all of you for having been here. Please, please, please do head over to Twitter. I'm just gonna scroll back across the PowerPoint so that you can find my handle and write it down. Please do download the PowerPoint if you are interested, if I've captured you enough, captured your attention enough, please do download the PowerPoint um, when I make it available uh, later on today. Please do have a look through it. Use it as a starting point, perhaps, for your own future research and hop onto Twitter, ask me questions. I'm more than happy to keep this, this lecture, this conversation going um, as, we, as we go through the day and as we go through the weekend. Thank you all ever so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I know that this talk was super niche. Um, and so I'm really glad. I'm, I'm so happy that there was anybody interested. I hope that you feel that this was worth your time uh, and that it was worth your pound. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy any other talks that you are signed up to uh, this weekend. And please do connect with me because I would love to, to speak with you all more. Jie jie. Zai jian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Before I get cut off, I'm going to read things that are in the chat. So thank you, Genevieve. I, I appreciate that. Do research. In the PowerPoint, there is a link to some biographies that you can use. Thank you, Felicity. I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you found it interesting. Thank you again, Valentina. Um, I appreciate you coming, especially with all of your existing expertise. Thank you, Matthew. I'm glad that you found it interesting too. Thank you very much for coming. He's so fascinating, isn't he? I, I've kind of got swept into it. I'm sure that I'm going to spend the rest of the weekend reading and, and researching more because there's so much to him. Um, I don't think that you will ever know everything. Oh, I do as well. Perhaps we should arrange um, maybe a, a, a reading session or something just amongst us as, as, as um, cinephiles. Um, I could look at making that happen. I meant cinephiles as in people who are cinephone as opposed to people who like films. <laughs> Perfect. Um, connect with me on Twitter if you can. Um, I don't know if you use Twitter, but um, we will make that happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Sonia. Yes, I love, um, I love how easy it is now to access Chinese culture. Something that I, I say to, to our kids is when I started learning Japanese uh, back when I was 16, so late 90s, early 2000s, it was so hard to find stuff um, to help practice and to get into, but media is so accessible these days. Even Lucian's works, now that they're out of copyright, you can find English translations all over the place. Um, it's really cool, it is really good. And for my own entertainment, if anybody has got any good um, Chinese dramas or anything to recommend, please do drop me a message, let me know. I'm always up for stuff to watch. Oh, Valentine, no, brilliant. Twitter is, is great. I've connected with so many um, amazing Chinese teachers um, and language teachers in general on Twitter. It is very worth doing. Um, I know obviously in China, not so easy. I don't know if you were still based in China, but not so easy. Um, but it is professionally it is very worth very uh, worthwhile.
Right, I know there are, the next person is very anxious to come into the room now, everybody. So I am going to um, end the meeting here. Um, you are free to leave. Again, thank you ever so much. And I do hope to connect with you all later. Oh, Valentina, I am sure. I am sure. It must be a, a big culture shock um, between the two countries. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Do connect with me. I will look forward to it.